So today we're going to have a couple of different people up here speaking to us. Um, our first speaker is Rabbi Karen Citrin from Talking About David. She's going to say some opening words for us. And then we'll have a couple of student uh, volunteers who are going to come up and introduce our keynote speaker, um, Dan Ottenheimer. So without further ado, we have Rabbi Karen Citrin from Talking About David. I'm honored to be here with all of you today. When I was a teenager growing up just up the road in Belmont, I started to hear about an organization called Facing History and Ourselves, located here in the Boston area. I was starting to think about my own identity as a young person, and I knew back then that the Holocaust deeply shaped the experience of Jews today. As we begin this morning, I want to acknowledge that the founder of Face History and Ourselves, Margot Stern Strong, died last week in her home in Brookline at the age of 81. She was a former school teacher who turned her dismay over the lack of Holocaust education in schools into a pioneering nonprofit educational organization that now develops anti hate curriculum for teens around the world. She would have loved to see what you are all doing here at Thurston Middle School today. Today is the first day of Passover, the Jewish holiday that commemorates when the ancient Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt. Last night, I had a Passover Seder with my family at our house where we told our story of freedom then and now. The Passover story reminds Jews that we were once strangers, and therefore, we should never oppress the stranger, someone who is different from us. Eighty years ago, during the Passover holiday, in the midst of the devastation of the Holocaust, Jews who lived in the Warsaw Ghetto, a slum in the Polish capital where the Jewish community was forced to live before being deported to death camps, rose up against the Nazis and attacked them with homemade weapons. We can all learn today from this spirit of resistance. One form of resisting is hearing stories of Holocaust survivors and children of survivors. As you listen today, I hope that you will join in this resistance. You participate in history by making Westwood, Massachusetts the United States, and hopefully our world, a place of goodness and kindness, where all people can live in safety and dignity. I know from personal experience how hard it can be for Holocaust survivors to tell their story. My great uncle, Harry Parzen, survived multiple concentration camps, including Auschwitz. The numbers tattooed on his arm will forever be engraved in my mind. 141421. His daughter, my cousin Judy, encouraged him to tell and to eventually record his story of survival. I'm grateful to Dan Ottenheimer for being here today to tell his story and the story of his father. While the Holocaust most deeply impacts the history of the Jewish people, the Shoah is not just about Jews. In addition, to six million Jews, five million other people who the Nazis deemed less than human were killed. LGBTQ political prisoners, people with disabilities. This is a piece of history that should be learned so that we can all do everything possible to prevent another genocide. You all know how the pyramid of hate works. Genocide begins when people when individuals degrade and belittle those who are not like them, especially minorities. This means that as individuals, you can be careful to treat others with dignity, be welcoming, especially to those who are different from you. I will leave you with an ancient Jewish saying, in a place where there are no humans, strive to be human. In other words, we have the responsibility to be humans even when others are not. 
As the rabbi at Temple Beth David here in Westwood, I'm especially glad to see members of our eighth grade class at the temple here today. As they know, because their rabbis and teachers remind them all the time at our temple, young people, like all of you, have a voice and can make a difference. We can all learn from our personal stories. Thank you, Dan, for sharing yours today. Center of Pittsburgh. 
So over the next few years, I actually learned his story because I heard his story several times. My dad spent more than 30 years telling his story, primarily at schools in Western Pennsylvania. But when he turned 90, he developed a number of serious health issues. And that's when I realized that the responsibility to tell my dad's stories was going to be passing to the next generation soon. So my dad passed away at the age of 92 in 2017. My mom passed away in 2018. And then in 2019, that's when I contacted Facing History and offered to be one of their second generation speakers. And so that's how I came to be here with you today, to share my dad's stories. So let me get started. My dad was born in 1925 in Konstanz, Germany. Konstanz was located way on the southern edge of Germany, right on the border with Switzerland. And it had about 35,000 people living there at the time. My dad had a pretty ordinary childhood. He lived with his parents, my grandparents, and his big sister Elsa, my aunt Elsa. The family lived in an apartment, and they didn't own a car. And those were both very typical for that time period in Germany. My grandfather owned a men's clothing store. <clears throat> now, most of my dad's neighbors and classmates were Christian. And that's because in Konstanz at the time, only not quite 2% of the population was Jewish. But my dad didn't think this was odd or unusual. That's just how things were. And in fact, someone's religion wasn't really that significant a part of who they were back then in Konstanz. My dad's family was quite well integrated into the Konstanz community. And he had a pretty ordinary childhood. He played with his big sister. He played with the neighborhood kids. Um, he liked to go hiking. And his favorite sport was soccer. He also went to public school. And once a week, he went to religious services at the town synagogue. And also went to religious school once a week at the synagogue. All of that changed in 1933. That was the year that Hitler came to power. And life for my dad got very bad very quickly, as it did for all of the Jews in Germany. The radio stations in Kashtan started to play propaganda all day. And that included condemning the Jews, accusing them of being the enemies of Germany. The newspapers started to print articles accusing the local Jewish residents of having committed illegal or immoral offenses. Sound trucks started to cruise through Kashtan, broadcasting anti-Jewish propaganda. That included telling people not to buy from Jewish-owned stores. And then stormtroopers, these are paramilitary guards, started to be stationed outside Jewish-owned stores, there to try to intimidate potential shoppers. There were a lot of changes in my dad's school. He went to a public elementary school. In 1933, he was eight years old. And, um, all of the students attended a class called Race Studies Class. And in that class, they were taught about the alleged superiority of the Aryan or German race. And the dangers inherent in all of the inferior races, in particular the Jews. All of the other students would go to Hitler Youth Meetings after school. These were filled with paramilitary training, along with more anti-Jewish propaganda. <laughs> At the school, there were assemblies once a week. And this is when all the kids would go into the school auditorium, and they would listen usually to one of Hitler's speeches. And those speeches were filled with all sorts of hateful rhetoric towards the Jews, accusing them of colluding with the enemies of Germany. Then the students were, learned, were taught these new songs that were supposedly very patriotic, but they were really very anti-Jewish. 
My dad remembered the lyrics for one of them in particular. It went, when Jewish blood squirts from the knife, everything is going well. So imagine if you were Jewish and in an auditorium, you had to sit and listen to all of the other students singing a song about stabbing Jews. It was pretty scary for my dad. The government started to announce new laws, and they were all designed to discriminate against the Jews. And they got progressively worse over time. Eventually, it got to the point where my dad was no longer allowed to go to concerts. He wasn't allowed to go to sporting events. He wasn't allowed to go to the movie theaters. He couldn't use the town swimming pools. My dad and his family weren't allowed to eat in the town restaurants. And if they went on a trip, they weren't allowed to stay in hotels. They weren't even allowed to sit on the town's park benches. So these changes, they were pretty bewildering to my dad because before Hitler came to power, he really thought he was no different from any of the other kids in the neighborhood. One day, my dad and his family were listening to the radio in the apartment. When the radio commentator decided that he needed to explain to his listeners about German Jews. This is what my dad remembered the announcer had to say. He said, that Jews were a dirty, smelly, foreign race, that they were conspiring to destroy Germany, and were just terrible people all around. Now, my dad, when he heard this, turned to his parents and said to them, that radio announcer, is he talking about us? Aren't we Jewish? And my grandparents said, don't listen to that idiot. He's one of those Nazis. The German people are honest, decent, educated people who won't believe these horrible lies. Well, my grandparents were wrong. <clears throat> Although some of the townspeople didn't believe the propaganda, many others started to believe it. My dad remembered another time. A neighbor came over to the apartment to do some repairs. And he was wearing a little Nazi emblem on a lapel pin. So my grandfather asked him why he was wearing that. And he said he wanted to support the government's efforts to straighten out the country. So my grandfather asked him, well, how did he feel about how the government was treating all of the German Jews? <coughs> and the neighbor said, well, it's unfortunate that the good Jews have to suffer along with the bad. So then my grandfather asked, okay, uh, which ones are we? Are we the good Jews or are we the bad Jews? And the neighbor said, oh, what are you talking about? Of course you're the good Jews, you're wonderful people. So next my grandfather said, you know most of the Jews here in Kashtans. Which of them are the bad Jews? that we good Jews need to suffer along with. And the neighbor thought about this for a while. And then he admitted that all of the Jews that he knew in Kashtans were good, honest people. So then my grandfather asked, where are the bad Jews? And this finally got the neighbor upset. He said, what are you talking about? Of course there's bad Jews. There's bad Jews everywhere. You listen to the radio, you read the newspaper, there is story after story about all the bad Jews in Germany. And that was the power of this government-sponsored anti-Jewish propaganda. People wound up believing the propaganda was true. Even when right in front of their own eyes, if they looked, they could see that it was false. Business at my grandfather's clothing store started to decline. People became afraid to shop there. And eventually it got so bad that my grandfather had to sell the store. He briefly got another job as a traveling tie salesman. But then he lost that job as well because he was Jewish. 
So my dad and his family put up with all this bias, all this persecution for several years. Finally, they realized that it wasn't going to get any better anytime soon. It was, in fact, it was probably going to get worse. So in 1936, three years after Hitler came to power, my grandparents contacted relatives that they had here in the United States and got them to agree to sponsor the family to immigrate here to the U.S. So they put together this very complicated immigration application package and sent it into the U.S. Embassy. <coughs> and then they waited because there was a very long backlog of German Jews trying to come here to the U.S. And the U.S. government at the time was kind of dragging its feet in terms of admitting Jews from Germany to the U.S. There was a quota every year, the number of, of immigrants from Germany that were allowed, and that quota was not even being met. So my dad and his family endured more persecution, more bias, <coughs> more oppression for another two years, waiting for two years. But finally, in the spring of 1938, they were informed by the U.S. Embassy that their application had come up for review. It had been reviewed and had been denied. We think it was denied because my grandfather had suffered an injury during World War I. And the embassy officials thought that my grandfather would not be employable here in the U.S., wouldn't be able to get a job because of it. So, my grandparents quickly contacted their relatives back here in the U.S. and got them to agree to put up a larger financial guarantee. And with that new financial guarantee, that new bond, they reapplied to come to the U.S., which put them back on the waiting list, waiting for the second application to come up for review. And while they were waiting, Chris Stallman. You've probably studied Chris Stallman a little bit. He was also known as the Knight of Broken Glass. And my dad remembered that night very clearly. It was November 10th, 1938. My dad was 13 years old at the time. He woke up suddenly in the middle of the night because he thought he heard an explosion. He ran to the back window of his apartment, looked out, and he could see that the Kashtan synagogue was in flames. It turns out that the synagogue had been blown up that night. Then, later that day, two Gestapo agents, secret police, came to my dad's apartment announced they were there to arrest my grandfather, refused to explain what he was being arrested for, and took him away. My grandmother spent the next several weeks desperately trying to find out what had happened to my grandfather. And no one would tell her anything. The town officials, the town police, no one would say anything about where my grandfather was, or what had happened. It turns out that my grandfather was taken to Dachau concentration camp. Now, Dachau in 1938 was not yet an extermination camp. It didn't have gas chambers, but it was still a very, very cool political prison. My grandfather and all the other prisoners were woken up every morning at dawn, and forced to come out of their barracks and stand for an hour for roll call. Then they spent the rest of the day jogging and marching around camp site. All they had to wear were very thin cotton jerseys and 
This was winter in Germany, so temperatures were below freezing. The food they had to eat was terrible, really not edible. Twice a day, they were given a piece of moldy bread and a bowl of thin, greasy soup. Now, the soup was obviously spoiled, but they and the, the food, the bread, but they really had no choice. It was eat it or starve. A lot of the prisoners came down with a foodborne illness called dysentery. That meant they got a very high fever, they had bloody diarrhea, and then if they ever tried to eat anything after they got sick, they would violently throw up. So this went on for several weeks. But after six weeks, my grandfather was released from Dachau. And one day without any advance notice, he just showed up again knocking at my dad's apartment door. He was very, very sick. He had lost a tremendous amount of weight. He was barely alive. But he was alive and slowly began to recover. A few months after that, the family finally got some good news. The U.S. Embassy informed them that their second application to come to the U.S. had been reviewed. And this time the application had been approved. So in the May of, 19, in May of 1939, when my dad was 14 years old, my dad and his family packed up their things took a train to France, boarded a ship, and came across the Atlantic Ocean, and began their new lives here in New York, here in the United States. So my dad's 14 years old. It's May. He's in New York. My grandparents decide that he is going to go back to school. There's just a few problems with my dad doesn't know any English. He knows maybe 10 words in English. So the principal of the school he showed up at decides that he's going to be placed in seventh grade when he really should have been in eighth grade. So there he is in the seventh grade classroom. He has a very thick German accent. He only knows five or 10 words of English. He the teachers can't understand him, he can't understand the teachers, the kids are ridiculing him because he's taller than everyone else, because he's a year older than everyone. He's wearing all the wrong clothes because he's wearing what kids in Germany wear to school, and that is clearly not what the kids in New York were wearing. He was bullied, he was ridiculed, um, he was teased, he had a terrible time. Fortunately, it was only two weeks until summer vacation. So they only had to put up with this for a couple of weeks. And then over the summer, my dad took an English class. And when he went back to school in the fall, he did a lot better. And he got befriended by one of the kids. Um, but I think what really made the difference was when the teacher decided to do a boys versus girls spelling contest, and my dad wound up being the last boy standing, and then all of the other boys were cheering him and encouraging him to spell the next word correctly. I think from that point on, he really he did it well with the other kids and did well. So let me skip ahead a couple of years to from 1939 to 1944. 1944 is when my dad graduated from high school. As soon as he graduated from high school, he enlisted in the U.S. Army. Now, my dad couldn't be drafted because he wasn't yet a U.S. citizen. But my dad really felt that he needed to be part of the U.S. efforts to fight back against Nazi Germany. So he went through the, the physicals, enlistment process and went through basic training. And then finally, in March of 1945, 
My dad was deployed by the U.S. Army back to Germany, back to his homeland. Now, in March of 1945, Germany by that time was in full retreat. And what my dad did, he was assigned to a group called the Military Government Security Guard. And what this group did was they would come into a town that had already been taken over by the U.S. forces. And they would talk to the town officials and pick someone out to be the mayor of the town who had never been a member of the Nazi party. And do the same thing with the police force and the fire department, put someone in charge who had never been a Nazi. And he'd make sure, he and his team would make sure that food was coming into the town, utilities were working properly. And once it seemed like the town could be self-sufficient, um, then my dad and his team would pick up and repeat all this in the next town. My dad was assigned to this group because he could speak German fluently. And so he was very good at speaking with the townspeople and getting everything working and picking the right people to be in charge. Well, as my dad moved from town to town, he was horrified by what he saw was going on there. Things had been pretty bad for him in Konstanz when he was a kid, before he left Germany. But he saw that things had gotten so much worse. The Nazis had climbed to the top of the Pyramid of Hate. Now, my dad had experienced a lot of those lower level behaviors when he was in Konstanz growing up. There was all the bias that he was exposed to and the systemic discrimination, the laws that had been passed. And of course, during Kristallnacht, there was the the destruction of property that occurred, and the violence, and the imprisonment. But now that he was back in Germany, my dad saw that the Nazis and so many others of the German citizens had completely lost all sense of human decency. Foreigners were being treated like livestock, like cattle. Jews were treated like cockroaches. Time and again, as my dad moved through these towns, he saw that the people who weren't considered German were being starved, were being forced to do hard labor, and were being beaten up or killed when they weren't needed anymore. But fortunately, this only lasted a couple of months because in May, of 1945, two months after my dad arrived, Germany surrendered. The war in Europe was over, and the Nazis were defeated. I'd like to take just a minute now to talk about some other relatives of my dad's. My dad was very fortunate, along with his family, to escape Germany when they did. But he had other relatives who were not as fortunate. In particular, the Vertans. These are my dad's very close relatives who lived in France. Uncle Leon, Aunt Martha, and Cousin Gigi. Aunt Martha was my grandmother's sister. And Cousin Gigi was one year younger than my dad. The two Families used to get together and vacation together almost every summer. After my dad and his family came here to the U.S., my grandmother and Aunt Martha still used to write letters to each other all the time, staying in touch. Well, in 1940, Germany invaded France and started to persecute all of the Jews that were living in France. Still, my grandmother and Aunt Martha were able to, to send letters and receive letters from each other. But in the summer of 1942, the letters from Aunt Martha suddenly stopped arriving without any warning. After World War II was over, my dad's family tried to find out 
And they learned that in July of 1942, Uncle Leon and Martha and Gigi had been deported from France and sent to Auschwitz concentration camp, where they were murdered. This picture you see, there, that's a picture of Gigi and my dad that was taken when my dad was on his way to the US. My dad and his family took that train to France, stayed overnight with the Veritax, and then boarded that ship the following morning. Gigi was 13 years old in this picture. She was 16 years old on the day that she was forced onto a train, sent to Auschwitz, and murdered by the Nazis on the day that she arrived. So, just take a little water break here for a second. So, a lot of people, when they hear about the Holocaust, they wonder, what were the ordinary German citizens doing? The bystanders. And while the Nazis were doing all of this, persecuting the Jews. And I think they wonder this, they ask this, because they're wondering, if I were there, what would I have done? Or if I ever see something similar, what do I think I would do? Now, we know that a lot of the German citizens were passive bystanders that just stood by and did nothing and watched the Jews being persecuted. And others actually participated and profited from the persecution of the Jews. But my dad had several stories about some of the people who didn't just stand idly by. And so what I'd like to do now is share a couple of those stories with you. And the first story I'd like to share is actually the only story that I knew growing up. And I knew this story not because my dad told me to, because my dad never talked about his life in this is the story that my grandfather used to tell me. And it took place just a little while after Hitler came to power. On this day, as my grandfather did on almost every day, he left the apartment that morning and proceeded to walk to his clothing store to open it up for the day. But that day, for the very first time, as he got near the store, he saw a stormtrooper standing out front. So my grandfather immediately turned around and went back to the apartment. And he dug out his World War I service medals. Then he went back to the store, went inside this time, and put all his medals on display in one of his big display windows. Then my grandfather went back outside the store, and proceeded to roll up his shirt sleeve. I mentioned that my grandfather had been wounded in battle during World War I. While he was out on patrol, a bullet had gone through his arm, shattering his elbow, leaving it so he couldn't bend his elbow anymore, and also leaving him with a very large scar. So my grandfather rolled up his shirt sleeve, so everyone could see the scar. He stood by the stormtrooper and waited. And it wasn't long before the first townsperson walked by. And this person looked at the stormtrooper and then looked at the medals in this display window, looked at my grandfather and his scar. And then the man turned to the stormtrooper and said to him, you're making a terrible mistake. Mr. Oppenheimer is a war hero. He was wounded in battle. He served our country honorably. 
He deserves our thanks and our support, not our scorn. Well, the stormtrooper tried to ignore the townsperson. He just stared straight ahead and refused to make eye contact. But then a second bystander came by, and a third bystander, and they all tried to convince the stormtrooper that what he was doing was wrong. More and more people started to gather outside the store, and their voices got louder and louder. And eventually, the stormtrooper realized that he had failed in his objectives. And so, he left his post. That week, business at my grandfather's store actually picked up, because his neighbors and the townspeople, they all went out of their way to show their support to my grandfather and to shop at his store. So this was a week when the bystanders made a difference. When people, even in Germany, were willing to stand up to the Nazis and to fight against social injustice. But still, as I mentioned, eventually, people became too afraid to shop at my grandfather's store. But for that week, they were willing to make it. You may have wondered about my dad's schoolmates. There they were, going to race studies class, learning about how dangerous the Jews were, going to Hitler Youth meetings, and getting exposed to more anti-Jewish propaganda, learning these terrible songs, going to assemblies, and listening to Hitler speeches. Well, at the end of the day, my dad's schoolmates would come over to my dad's apartment, knock on the door, and ask if Fritz could come out and play with me. All that propaganda didn't matter to them at all. I don't know if they didn't believe it, or if they just didn't believe it didn't apply to their friend Fritz, but they didn't let it, let it affect them at all. This next story I have to tell you took place in 1938, spring of 1938. That was when Germany announced that they were going to annex Austria. Austria was a neighboring German-speaking country. So the German army marched into Austria. The Austrian government didn't try to stop it or resist it at all. Austria was now part of Germany. Now, a couple days after that, perhaps a week or so, there was a knock on my dad's apartment door. And when they opened the door, they saw a family standing. And the family explained that they were Jews from Austria. And they had tried to check into the hotel in Karstadt's. But they were told that Jews aren't allowed to stay in hotels in Germany. But the hotel manager had suggested that they could come over to the Oppenheimer apartment, and then maybe the Oppenheimers would be able to put them up for the night. So my dad's family invited the Austrian Jewish family in and fed them dinner and heard their tale. They said, that their neighbors had broken into their house while they were in it, forced them out onto the street, and proceeded to ransack the house. While this was happening, the Austrian police had stood by and watched and done nothing to try to stop them. Now, the Austrian Jewish family felt they were fortunate to get out of the house unharmed. They had decided that they were going to try to flee all of this and go to Switzerland. But that was not something that was very easy to do back then. Although Switzerland shared a border with Austria, as well as sharing a border with Germany, it was quite hard to cross into Switzerland, except at one of the official border crossings. And the Swiss government was uh, not very keen to accept lots of refugees. So you had to have lots of official documentation 
that show that you have a reason to be in Switzerland, a visa, work papers. Otherwise, you weren't allowed to cross at any of the official border crossings. Um, and even though the border was pretty long, it wasn't very easy to sneak across because there was a very natural barrier. Either the Rhine River or Lake Konstanz made it very hard to cross except at one of the official border crossings at one of the bridges. Nonetheless, the Austrian Jewish family knew that Konstanz was right on the Swiss border. And so they had come to Konstanz with the hope that they would find some way to sneak over the border. So the Austrian Jewish family stayed with my dad's family overnight. And the next morning, there was, um, the, the two families decided that they were going to go for a walk together. And they were walking for a while until they got to a field. And then my grandfather pointed to a stream that was running down the field, the middle of the field, and said, do you see that stream? That is the border between Germany and Switzerland. What my grandfather had done was taken them all for a walk to a special part of Konstanz called the Altstadt, or the Old City. And the Old City of Konstanz was actually located on the south side of the Rhine River. In fact, it's the only part of Germany located south of the Rhine. So it turns out that if you know the Konstanz geography really well, it's actually pretty easy to get to a particular point in Konstanz where you can sneak over the border without anybody noticing. Well, the Austrian Jewish family couldn't believe their good fortune. They hopped over the stream. They were free in Switzerland. That family must have contacted their friends back in Vienna, Austria, because a few days later, there was another knock on my dad's apartment door. It was another Austrian Jewish family. And over the next several weeks, there was a steady stream of Austrian refugees coming to my dad's apartment, spending the night there, and being shown the way to freedom the next day. One day, there was a knock at the door. But instead of being a family, it was a Konstanz police inspector. The police inspector invited himself into the house. And after a while, a bit of small talk, he explained why he was there. He said, I know what you're doing. You're helping to smuggle Austrian Jews into Switzerland. I'd like to help. But my help will cost a certain amount of money per person. Well, my grandparents were very alarmed when they heard this offer. The amount of money he was asking for was very small. It, it was not enough to be useful as a bride or some way to, to convince the border guards to let these, this family get across. And back then, it was very dangerous for a Jewish person to say no to law enforcement. Much too easy to be fined, to be arrested, so my grandparents felt they had a choice. They agreed to this proposal. So the next morning, at the agreed upon time, my dad's family, as well as all of the Austrian Jewish families who had been staying in the apartment overnight, they all came out of the apartment down to the street. There, as agreed upon, was the Konstanz police inspector. The Austrian Jewish families handed over the money that had been requested. And the Konstanz police inspector handed back official documentation giving them permission to cross the border into Switzerland. Then the police inspector handed all of the money to the taxi drivers who were waiting on the street. The money was cash. The families all climbed into the cabs. They were driven to the border, the paperwork was in order, 
They were waved through by the border guards, and the families were free in Switzerland. This new arrangement continued for another several weeks, until eventually the Swiss government themselves decided to completely <laughs> shut down their border and proceeded to deport back to Germany anyone who they had discovered had crossed the border. My dad and his family and this police inspector wound up helping something like 300 Austrian Jewish refugees escape into Switzerland during this time period. I view this police inspector as a true upstander, someone who is willing to risk his career as well as probably the health and safety of his family in order to help these refugees flee to Switzerland. I'd like to finish up my talk by sharing a few pictures. My dad, once he started to speak about the Holocaust, he went back and visited Germany, went back to Konstanz several times. And uh, on a few of these occasions, he was actually invited back by the mayor of Konstanz. And there were three trips that he went back to Germany when I went along with him. So these are some pictures of some of the things that were in the stories that I told you. This is the building where my grandfather's store was. And you can see there's some big display windows there. Um, you can imagine, perhaps, what it was like to have my grandfather's World War I service medals on display in those windows, and what it was like to have a crowd gather in front of this building while my grandfather and the stormtrooper were standing there. This is the building the apartment building that my dad was living in during Kristallnacht. And that white building over there, that's where the synagogue was taken. After the synagogue was blown up, it, all the rubble was carted away and that white building was put up instead. So if you were asleep in this apartment building and there was an explosion in the next lot over, you'd probably wake up as well and run to a window to try to figure out what was going on. This is that field in the old city portion of Konstanz, where the border between Germany and Switzerland is just a stream. And you could imagine if you were trying to escape into Switzerland, you could hop over that stream and not even get your feet wet. This picture is from a newspaper article that was written about one of the times that my dad was invited back to Germany by the mayor of Konstanz. Now, the organizers of that event put together a reunion of dad, my dad with some of his old schoolmates. And in the article, my dad is quoted as saying how much he appreciated that his friends didn't treat him any differently, despite all of the propaganda that they were being exposed to. Here's my last picture. This is of a memorial that was put up in Konstanz for all the Jews of Konstanz who were murdered during the Holocaust. My dad and his family, they were very fortunate to escape one day. I have told you that they had applied to come to the U.S. in 1936, and it took three years before they were actually able to come. May of 1939 is when they left Germany. Well, in September of 1939, just a couple months later, Germany invaded Poland. That was essentially the start of World War II, and that disrupted the flow of immigrants from Germany 
to the United States. And in another year, by 1940, the U.S. totally shut down all immigration from Germany. So if that application process that my dad and his family had to go through had just taken a couple of additional months, it's quite possible that my dad and his family would have been stuck in Germany, not allowed to come to the U.S. So what might have happened then? Well, in October of 1940, just a year later, all of the Jews that were still living in Konstanz and in the surrounding area were forced out of their homes and deported to an internment camp, the Gurus internment camp, located in France. There, they were forced to remain until 1942, when they were deported a second time. This time, they were deported either to the Sobibor extermination camp or to Auschwitz, where they were all murdered. So this, this memorial is for all the Jews of Konstanz who were murdered by the Nazis this way. My dad and his family could easily have had their name on this memorial as well. So that's all I had to share with you this morning. When I think about what happened to my dad, it gives me a lot to reflect on. But what I'd like to do now is, is pause and give all of you a chance to reflect and maybe to ask questions. first 
edition of those memoirs, he actually wrote them in German. And there was a Konstanz University professor who he had met during one of his visits that uh, encouraged him to write his memoirs and helped to publish them in Germany, actually published in Germany uh, before they were available in English. Um, he was very bittersweet about going back to his homeland and seeing um, what it was like there. But nostalgic as well. So we were able to walk around and see things like the school where he went and the apart two apartments that he lived in. I know there was a law that was passed when people from leaving Germany when they stopped on the way to go to America. There wasn't a law forbidding Jews from leaving Germany. In fact, it was really more the opposite. The Nazis would, would have been very happy to have all of the Jews of Germany to, to flee, to leave. Um, there were some restrictions. Like, you couldn't take any German currency with you. Very limited in terms of the possessions you were allowed to take. So, you pretty much had to abandon your life if you were, if you were Jewish and decided you were going to leave Germany. Um, a lot of the issues, like with getting into Switzerland, was because all of the other countries were not interested in having a huge influx of German Jews come into their country. It was, um, the economy was pretty bad around the world back then, it was the, the depression, or just coming out of the Great Depression. So having a lot of foreign workers coming to the country it was something that a lot of countries were resistant to, not to mention if there was any anti-Semitism as well, then that also was a sort of the reason for people to say, no, we don't want all these Jews to come into the country. Do we have time for a couple more questions? Any other ones to want to hear? Did you ever get to meet your grandfather? I was fortunate to know my grandfather, my dad's parents, and his sister Elsa quite well. They lived in New York. Uh, when I was growing up in Pittsburgh, and we used to you know, visit them at least once a year. Um, and so that's why I was able to learn that one story from my grandfather about this stormtrooper standing outside of his, his uh, store. <coughs> my dad must have told my dad and Paul not to talk about the Holocaust whenever we visited. Because they were, they were very, uh, you know, they really didn't say much about it, except for that one story that my grandfather would say to us. Um, my grandmother, and was, was someone who just really, really loved her grandchildren. She was just, um, you know, would do things. She got very emotional whenever on a Friday evening there was a little blessing she would say over, over the kids or whatever. And, and I think that that was just uh, something that was left over from her probably believing that she would, you know, never have grandchildren that life was just so terrible. And the fact that um, my aunt Ilsa wound up having two kids and my, my dad had two kids as well, I think that was something that she just thought was a miracle. 
want to to have uh, Jewish services. Uh, nothing's stopping that. I think that a lot of um, the secrecy occurred either later or if a family decided they wanted to pretend that they weren't Jewish. Whereas my, my dad, I think it was very well known that they were Jewish and so they weren't able to pretend that they were Just hearing the stories about your father is going to really be Sorry. <coughs> How does hearing the stories about your father change the way you read him? My, my attitude towards my dad, I think, evolved very slowly. And I think, in hindsight, I think my dad sort of has explained a little bit more about what happened to me. More when I was your age, I think I would have been able to handle it, as opposed to completely hiding it until I was 20 years old or so. Um, when he first said that he was going to you know, work on his memoirs or what happened to him when he was in Germany, my thought was, oh, gee, yeah, that's, that's kind of nice, you know, you're, you're retiring, he was about was in his 60s, and you're going to have a hobby. You're going to write your autobiography. Isn't that, isn't that neat? And I just didn't really understand. I thought it was just you know, an ordinary person's autobiography. And I didn't realize that, in fact, he had all of these things inside him to tell that I didn't know about. And so it sort of evolved over time. I got a, sort of drips and drafts a little bit that came out. Um, my son, that is my, my dad's grandchildren, all of them, my sister's kids as well, they think my dad is, uh, or thought my dad is a hero in terms of enduring everything that he did and, uh, and also having the courage to speak about it. Um, the, uh, but he was still just my dad for a long time to me. You know, it's like I knew him as, a, you know, as my dad, and then adding this extra piece about his his history, his background, and what happened to him, it was something that didn't suddenly completely change who he was in my mind. He, if I can have one more thing, my dad was always. When I was growing up, he was always a person who um, was very, very tolerant towards me and my sister. He never yelled at us. Um, he was always very welcoming. He always liked to help kids um, uh, in terms of his volunteer work and things like that. He was a Boy Scout adult leader. And I think a lot of that was because he felt like he was deprived of his childhood because of all the hatred that he was experiencing. And so he, all, whenever he saw a kid and had some sort of difficulty, he would always try to do what he could to make that child's life as happy as possible. And so I saw that about him, but I never really understood the reason behind it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did your grandparents ever return to Germany? I don't think they did. I don't remember ever hearing about them going back to Germany. Same with my aunt. I don't think she ever did. There is a lot of... Um, repressed feelings of Hating what happened to you and resent, resenting anyone who might have been involved, and maybe that was one reason why they decided they had no interest in going back. My aunt's um, kids, my two cousins came, have gone back, had gone back. 
uh, visiting sometimes with my dad. Why didn't they just leave us here? I mean, I'm supposed to have been in my dad. That's a good question. Um, why didn't my dad's family just leave us? The, the people who flee to Switzerland, it's not like their lives were suddenly perfectly bad. In Switzerland, they usually wound up staying in a refugee camp. And if they didn't have somewhere else to go besides Switzerland, they were basically stuck in a camp. Not very good conditions. No way to be employed to get a job, so you're sort of on welfare. Um, you weren't allowed to take any of your belongings with you. Um, no German currency. So no matter how well off you were, if you were to flee into Switzerland, you were going to have a pretty tough life. So it would be much better to get permission to be an official immigrant to a country like the US. And that's why my dad's family was willing to, to wait. Now, um, my grandfather had an interesting story. When, it, I mean, the, so what the family had to do is every day, there was sort of, you had to make a decision about, was today the day to say, boy, the U.S. government isn't going to come through. We're never going to uh, get official permission, so we're just going to have to risk it. We're just going to have to flee into Switzerland. They could have done that any day. But every day was sort of a balancing act, trying to figure out how bad is it here? Can we just wait it out a little longer? And hopefully, we'll be able to come to the U.S. When my grandfather was arrested during Kristallnacht, the two Gestapo agents put him in a car. And they were driving for a while, and then stopped at, outside the store. And then the agent said, we're going into this store. Um, you wait in the car. And they both left and proceeded to go into the store. So my grandfather is sitting there going, what on earth is going on? Why, why did they do this? The door was evidently unlocked. He could have gotten out. Do these people want me? Are they feeling guilty you know, because I'm a veteran? Do they want me to escape? If I try to escape, should I just run to the border or should I go back and get my family? And, and we should all go to the border. Are they waiting to see what I'm going to do so that they can arrest me and beat me up or show that I am not an honorable person and they're going to make me an example? Are they waiting so they can shoot me because they don't want to um, you know, have to deal with, with taking me somewhere or being a, a veteran and so forth? So all of these, he, my grandfather sitting there, he didn't know any of the answers. He didn't know, have any idea what was the best thing to do? He sat in the car. He waited until the Gestapo agents had come back out of the store. They returned to the car. They got in the car. They drove him, continued to Dachau. And we still don't know whether that was the best outcome or not. And this sort of agony of trying to decide, you know, what is the right thing to do is something that all of the Jewish people in Germany had to face sort of every day um, in terms of how do they get out of this mess. Um, what happened to your, to uh, Clara? My grandmother? No, Oh, did she? Are you? To cousin Gigi? Okay. So, yeah, let me. This picture? 
So, um, so Clara is my grandma, and that's the the adult in that picture, and um, Fritz and Ilza are my dad and my my aunt. So, and over here, these are both my grandparents, my Opa Ludwig and uh, Oma Clara. So. Both of my grandparents wound up coming to the United States and living in New York. They lived in the Bronx for many years. And I knew them well. How did him being a survivor affect you like a person a lot of time to go about his life? You know, when I was... Uh, the question was, how did being a survivor affect my life in terms of being the descendant of a survivor? I, I think my dad did a pretty good job of making me have no idea that I was a descendant of a survivor in terms of what my life was like in, in uh, middle school and high school, and I, I was Jewish. And there's a little bit of uh, anti-Semitism. Let's just say, back then, kids picked on you for anything that made you different. So, you know, it's a little bit of being picked on for being Jewish. But nothing I would say was extreme. And I think I had a pretty ordinary life. Over the years, as my dad started to speak about the Holocaust, and I would, when he like, spoke a few times in Boston, and I sat in on it, or sat in on it when he visited my sister who lives in D.C., you know, I started to, to say, okay, this is, this is very heavy stuff that's part of our family, part of our family legacy. And it's very important, I realize it's very important to share that with other people. Um, but also, it's, I'm not an amateur historian. I'm kind of a science fiction and fantasy sort of person. I'm a Star Wars, Star Trek, Marvel comic movie um, person. And, uh, you know, this heavy historical tragedies and, and massacres and so forth. It's not something that I enjoyed really understanding or, or digging into deeply. So as I started to understand what was going on and what happened in my dad's past, my sense was, all right, I know that someday I'm going to have to really, you know, make this a part of what's important to me as well. But not today. You know, I'm busy with my job, with raising my kids, so I'm just going to put it off. So I sort of tried to, to keep it at arm's length for a while until my dad got sick. And then it sort of hit me that um, I better learn everything I can from him. I need to really, it's time for me to uh, accept that as a responsibility. And uh, I'm very thankful that he wrote his memoirs and wrote it all down because without that, if I was just going on my memory of things he told me, I, it would have been uh, it would have been much harder to be able to, to share his stories. I mean, some things like my grandfather's story about about having a stormtrooper in front of his door. That's a story that I remember he told me several times, you know, that's been with me since I was your age, or all of your ages. So uh, um, that I could have continued to tell. But otherwise, it's, a lot of it was really, when my dad became sick, it was like, okay, it's, now it's my turn. It's going to be my turn. And I was about to do that. Another thing that I started to do 
in terms of a volunteer activity. Um, when uh, I retired, according to the bio you guys heard, um, I'm also a volunteer instructor for a group that does bystander intervention workshops. That is how you can more effectively, if you see some someone being harmed in some way, um, that, you know, there's a sort of instinctual reaction to sort of freeze and not know what to do. So we have workshops where we, we try to tell people, if you see something like this, here's some things you can do to break the ice and, and try to take action. And I decided to do that because it's um, something that I feel is very, very important. And that's something that I, even before my dad, Start to, I think there was time to talk about my dad. It's something that I felt I had to do. It's, I think people who realize their part in, you know, their families were <coughs> victims of the Holocaust have, are more sensitive, many of us are more sensitive to seeing acts of hate, acts of violence anywhere in the world and um, are because we know as you study the pyramid of hate that those lower levels if not stopped if not checked in some way will you know will just escalate and the culture of society will move into the upper levels and so those of us who are part of it sort of realize that and Realize that every one of us has to take the steps to try to, to halt that escalation. And you know, part of the reason why we do these talks, or why I do this talk, is to hope that each of you, having heard my dad's stories and my dad's testimony, in addition to what you've been studying, is that you'll also be part of this early warning system to be a little bit more sensitive to. What can happen when hate is allowed to escalate and to help fight back against it? Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you, Justin, for facing history.